Welcome to Danvers Daily. I'm Beverly Flanagan, one of the volunteers here at DCAT, and today we have as our guest Matthew Martin, Restoration Manager of Buildings and Grounds at Glen Magna Farm right here in Danvers. Welcome, Matthew. Oh, thank thank, you, thank so you for joining us Thank you today. for having me, and uh, this is a really lovely studio, and I'm really looking forward to this. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So let's just get right into it and tell us what is Glen Magna. Sure. Um, Glen Magna Farms is a property that's owned by the Danvers Historical Society. Um, and the property goes uh, all the way back to 1812, as we know it now. Uh, the War of 1812, there was, uh, America was at war with the British Empire again. And there was a wealthy shipping captain named Joseph Peabody. Um, and he wanted to hide his assets and protect his family because he was close to the water in Salem. Mm -hmm. So he wanted to move inland. So he rented um, the farmhouse, which we know as Glen Magna Farms now, from Jonathan Ingersoll uh, in 1812. And as the war winded down, um, he um, fell in love with the property so much um, that in 1814 he purchased the property for $4,000. Wow. Yeah, and so the property uh, then became a summer home of the Endicott and Peabody family all the way from 1814 all the way up until 1958. Um, and during that time period, that long reign, uh, the Endicotts and Peabody's created all kinds of lavish gardens um, and also created all kinds of uh, beautiful buildings. One of the most famous ones is a National Historic Landmark called the Derby Summer House or oh, the yes. McIntyre Tea House. Yes. Yeah, which is built in 1793 by Samuel McIntyre. Uh, yeah, and there's a picture of it yes. right there. Yeah. Yes. Very and distinctive looking. It's very distinctive. And that was originally built for Elias Haskett Derby who was another shipping captain, and mm -hmm. uh, it's theory that he may have been uh, the first American millionaire. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And uh, that sat on Derby's farm, which is close to where the North Shore Mall is now. And then in 1901, the Endicotts uh, had it moved over to Glen Magna with a uh, horse and carriage. Which was yeah. a common enough oh, event uh, back yeah. in that day. Absolutely, um, yes. So. Just to be clear, what is the relationship of Glen Magna with the Danvers Historic Society? Oh, that's a great question. So in 1958, uh, Louise uh, Endicott was 98 years old. She passed away and didn't have any children. And the rest of the family didn't want the, the buildings or the grounds. Uh, but they did take the assets. Mm -hmm. And this uh, land was going to end up becoming all Cape homes or businesses. Um, and remind, I just wanted to let everyone know that this property um, was over 330 acres. So it was, a, it was originally big, a very big property. Very big yeah. Property. And so it was a really unique partnership where the Danvers Historical Society and the town of Danvers got together, uh, where the Danvers Historical Society purchased the 11 acres around the Derby Summer House mm -hmm. to protect what we now know as Glen Magna Farms. And the town purchased the surrounding acreage to create what's now known as Endicott Park. Ah. And that acts as a natural uh, buffer to protect Glen Magna Farms. And we work really close with the town to protect mm. uh, all this. There is some confusion because we're a nonprofit, a pr uh, private organization in the middle of a town property. Yeah. So we are, yeah. we are two different organizations, um, but we were originally all one. But we also work really closely with the town and we're great neighbors. Wonderful. Yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah, I also just wanted to add, too, we also have uh, a wonderful staff at the Danvers Historical Society. Uh, some of uh, my fellow managers, we have Heather Palm, who's the Director of Sales and Events. Uh, we have Laura Silly, who's the Director of Programming. Kate Perkins uh, is the Director of Finance and Technology. And my assistant, uh, Buildings and Grounds Manager, uh, Kristen Clemson, uh, Christian Clemson. Uh, we just make uh, a really good team, and none of this could be done without them and our all, all our volunteers. Teamwork yeah. is everything. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. And uh, so that is good to know. I gather that uh, programs and events are held at Glen Magna Farm. And from what you've just told me, someone could call Danvers Historic Society to maybe set up a yeah. wedding or other type of uh, event there? Yeah, absolutely. The best mm -hmm. way to, um, we do a lot of events there, both uh, public and private. Um, and so uh, you, if you're interested in an event at Glen Magna Farms, uh, usually glenmagnafarms.org is a, a good place to check it out. Okay. Um, and we do all kinds of things um, for the community. We do beer gardens in the summer. We host educational projects, um, garden tours. Mm. Uh, we have a lot of volunteers. Um, and then we also do um, private functions like weddings and corporate functions. Um, 
We also have uh, two other buildings that we take care of in town, uh, Tapley Memorial Hall in the Page House, mm -hmm. uh, right mm -hmm. on Page Street. And Tapley Memorial Hall also does smaller functions and other educational programs. And that's where they have the Parade of Trees. That's where they have, exactly, the Parade time. of Trees and all kinds, of, right. all kinds of great stuff down at Tapley Hall. Yeah. So definitely check that out as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So can you describe the gardens? What are your thoughts? What are your visions? What sure. happens in the garden? Absolutely. So originally, um, working for a historical society, it's really important that we stay true to the historic fabric of, of the gardens and the buildings. And we do that the best we can. Uh, originally, a lot of these, uh, these gardens, um, well, the word garden literally means enclosed space or a walled off space. Um, and so when I you did not know that. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. it's a, it's a closed in space. Uh, so that's um, when you go when you go to Glen Magna Farms, you'll feel that it's like they, we call them garden rooms, almost like in a home. Ah. Yeah. So you're looking now at the Chamberlain Garden. You see that hedge. Oh yeah. That, that kind of encloses you, and then beyond that, you have a winding path that takes you to the shrubbery garden and the rose garden, just like rooms in a house. So they're all different, and it's mm. that sanctuary that the Endicotts really um, were trying to create. Um, but they all flow together even though they're different rooms. Right there is the Chamberlain Garden, which was built by mm -hmm. Joseph Chamberlain in 1889. Very formal. Oh, it's very, very formal, like yes. Almost, I would think English or mm. French or oh, something Oh, it's, a, it's when based I see on uh, Italian and English style uh, gardening, and so you definitely see that formality to that. And uh, so we try to really keep true to, to that um, idea of uh, paying tribute to that. Um, in terms of design. In terms of design and things like that. Mm -hmm. But um, we are now in the 21st century and we have uh, inv new environmental concerns um, and mm -hmm. um, you know, with climate change and things like that. So it's really important that we also kind of pivot and really think about the future as well. So a lot of my visions for the garden have been trying to think about who comes after me, mm -hmm. right? And who, who's going to inherit this because I am so thankful for the gardeners that came before me that actually gave us, this community, this wonderful gift. Oh, yeah. And so I want to make sure that I, we can pass this down uh, to the next generation. And so by doing that, mm -hmm. I've been trying to plant a, uh, an array of diverse trees and shrubs um, mm -hmm. because I don't know what the future holds with climate, you know, the economy, or what our values will be as far as green spaces of 50 to 100 years from now. So we have a lot of declining trees in the background just because of their age. And so what I've been doing for the last 14 years is planting small, diverse trees next to these de declining trees. So they're establishing a strong root system. So when, one of these, when the tall trees come down one by one, these new trees, just like in a forest, once they get that light, should shoot right up and take its place. Some of these trees, yeah, so some of these trees might not make it because we don't know what the climate's going to be. That's why I plant diverse mm -hmm. trees. So hopefully at least half of them make it. And we mm -hmm. can have that, those beautiful trees that we have at Glen Magna for the next generation. And one of the questions I wanted to ask you mm -hmm. has to do with climate change. Oh, okay. Sure. Like, how did the gardens fare in the drought of 2022? And then this year, twen not this year, but last year, 2023, was heavy rain. Sure, yeah. That's um, a lot of stress on plants. It's a lot think. of stress. It's amazing how much stress plants can take. Um, and I, I'm a big believer in planting tough-as-nails plants just for that reason. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. what's plants can handle stress or extremes. The problem that we're having now is drastic changes that happen very quickly. So that for was fairly quick to it, go from drought to rain. Exactly. So that's the problem. Mm -hmm. We're going from, from you know, a really um, warm February to all of a sudden it gets really cold in, in March. And then, you, you know, you, we lose all our fruit or flowers in the spring. Mm -hmm. um, or, yeah, the extreme drought and then you have a lot of rain. That, that drought did a number on our trees and, and really hurt, it did hurt them. Um, we did mm -hmm. thankfully get a lot of rain, but the damage was done. Uh, from that drought yeah. and the thing about stress with trees is that you never really see the um, the damage right away from the drought it's usually four or five six years later delayed reaction. it's delayed because trees uh, mm -hmm. have stored carbohydrates and energy in their vast root system and so they're living on their stored resources but they're going to run out mm -hmm. from that stress and just like people sometimes we're running ragged what happens we eventually get sick mm -hmm. so that's when insects and diseases come in 
mm. and to give the final blow for these trees. So what we're trying to do, the garden team at Glen Magna Farms, is really trying to baby these trees. Not only baby them, but also plan ahead with those new diverse trees that mm. we're thinking about, because some of them will not make it. So we're doing the best we can. Planning yeah. when we don't know. Exactly, what, yeah. Always thinking doing. about the future. That's, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm curious about seasonal tasks mm. in the garden. It's winter. A lot of us might think there's nothing going on in the garden, but most gardeners are always busy either planning, thinking, dreaming, or doing. Mm -hmm. What kind of tasks do you have going on now in sure. the winter? Well, uh, we've been lucky in the sense where we haven't had much snow, although snow is actually good for the garden. Because I've heard it called poor man's mulch. Yeah, yes, it is, yep, yes. because it takes some of that atmospheric nitrogen, and, and it's great, especially uh, right mm -hmm. in kind of early spring, it can be helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, it also creates an insulation on the plants that helps from that extreme weather that we might mm -hmm. get from the mm -hmm. cold. Um, but believe it or not, me personally, I feel most of the gardening is done in the in the winter months. Okay. So um, when we yes yes <laughs> so in the gardens, uh, most people think, and I did too before I started gardening, is that oh it's it's the summer, spring mm -hmm. and summer or early fall. That's just the upkeep. That's uh -huh. just maintenance. That's keeping that walled in space, the garden, the enclosure, be from becoming a meadow or mm. a forest again. You know, you're weeding, you're weed whacking, um, you're watering, right? You're, 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 you're keeping mm. things at bay. So it's just mm. repetitive, repetitive. In late fall, in winter is when you can actually do the things that count and matter that's gonna make your life easier for the next year. Like right? for instance? For instance would be top dressing the lawn with compost is a great thing to do. Um, I don't have time to do that uh, in the summertime, plus you wouldn't want to because People the, the, the look, right. Mm -hmm. um, that's the time when we um, do all our digging and dividing of perennials, ah. right? So right when the ground's not frozen, so like, you know, it could be even up into December, that's when we're digging up okay. our plants. Okay, oh, um, yeah. okay. So you're busy in the winter. Yes. That's what I'm picking yes. up from that. Um, and as I understand it, not directly related to Glen Magna, but you have a podcast. Oh, you yes. You want to just tell us about, oh, and here's another view of the formal oh, garden. Oh, yes, beautiful. yes. <laughs> Thank you. Just beautiful. Yeah, so the podcast is called, um, uh, it's something that I've been, I was a guest on the Native Plant Podcast uh, back in 2020, um, and I talked a lot about Glen Magna Farms, uh, and it's a national podcast, and we actually started moving into South America as well. Mm, interesting. Yeah, so um, it's called the Native Plant Podcast, and I am now a co-host and co-producer of the show, and we really push um, all the benefits of using native plants in the garden. Which is what you're doing at Glen Magna. Yes. So I think that is an interesting relationship. Oh, absolutely, yeah. We started guys. using a lot of native plants at Glen Magna Farms just because of their value uh, to wildlife, uh, and they're also beautiful as well. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times people don't think native plants would be beautiful because they have uh, bad, a bad publicist. We call them weeds like oh. butterfly weed, <laughs> iron weed, Joe pie weed, right? Uh -huh. All these weeds. And the reason for that is just because um, when the colonists first arrived in America, anything that wasn't growing in a straight row was deemed wasteful and not useful. But indigenous people knew that these plants were useful and valuable. Um, and so I think we just need I to change the names. <laughs> yeah, I would think mm -hmm. so. A lot of them I know have even medicinal or culinary value. Yeah, absolutely. Any passions of beyond gardening that you have in your life? Oh, outside of gardening? Yeah, I, uh, I might be cursed because I have another physically demanding passion, which would be martial arts. Wow. So, so, uh, well, perhaps we'll have to have you back <laughs> to talk about that one yeah. sometime. Yes, thank you. <laughs> but uh, yep. in the meantime, thank you for joining us today. Oh, I really appreciated I this. I think that we learned a lot about aspects of Danvers history, about the Glen Magna Farm, about gardening in general. Yes. And climate change in real life locally. Yes. How it affects things locally. So thank you for joining oh, us. Oh, thank today. you, Beverly. I really appreciate it. And, um, and there's a beautiful dahlia. <laughs> that, yeah, that's a wonderful. I love dahlias at Glen Magna Farm. Yes. We use a lot of dahlias.